And uh, risky and low risk is measured by number and frequency of drinks, quantity of alcohol consumption. That's how we define whether someone is at no risk because they don't drink at all, or they do drink, but at a rate that probably doesn't pose risks to their health, or they drink at a number and frequency that there's a lot of evidence that suggests it is gonna pose long-term risks or short-term risks, could make existing health problems worse or create new health problems. And then disorder is defined with the DSM-5 as basically number of consequences, uh, technically in the last year. Um, so we're gonna focus on the risky category today, and that's because disorder is defined by consequences described here that don't really mention gender. Um, so they don't really exclude people. You could argue here that gender and race and other, and maybe class impact how people experience consequences from their use. But when we um, diagnose it, or when we use screening tools that correlate with a diagnosis of an alcohol use disorder, we do use gender neutral words here. Um, so I'm not gonna focus today on how we define alcohol use disorders. We're gonna talk about risky drinking and low risk limits. So back to uh, the risky and low risk limits. How do we identify, how do we know um, as much as we can, how much someone is drinking to know if it's posing risk to their health? Well, we use screening tools and I would divide it between a full screen and a brief screen. So if we start with a full screen, these are commonly used tools, 10 questions or less that ask about both number of drinks and consequences. We call it a full screen because they do both. And if someone's positive on a full screen, they typically get a brief intervention if that clinic has implemented um, a workflow to do this. And that brief intervention is a brief conversation uh, that uses principles of motivational interviewing and hopefully harm reduction. It's a short conversation because this again is a medical setting, maybe primary care, um, not a counseling session where someone would have more time. So these conversations are typically five minutes or less, but there's good evidence that they can be effective uh, towards reducing uh, alcohol use with adults. And the commonly used full screens or the audit, we're gonna look at these, the US audit and the TAPS. Some clinics use a brief screen um, and that's because, you know, they're trying to reduce the burden of patients on how many questions they fill out. You know, if they fill out a full screen on alcohol use, they're looking at probably 10 questions. If we want to do a full screen for drug use, that's another 10 questions. If we're screening for depression, that's another nine questions. These questions really add up. So some clinics try to reduce that burden by first just doing a very brief screen, which could be one question or three questions and kind of weed out folks who are negative on that and only folks who are positive on the brief screen get that full screen. So the workflow here, this pretty much covers what we typically see in our primary care setting or emergency medicine where we wanna screen for alcohol use. So these uh, tools in black here, the single question, the audit C, the audit, the US audit and TAPS are probably the most commonly used tools in the US to do this. And this is what we're gonna look at uh, today, right now. So let's look at the single alcohol question. Uh, Smith and colleagues determined that this had good sensitivity and specificity for identifying risky drinking. Uh, and that's great, but the problem here that we're gonna focus on today is it breaks people down into two binary dichotomous um, gender categories, men and women. Um, and the problem with that is not everyone identifies as a man or a woman. So this is an exclusive screening tool, even though it's valid with that population. Another brief screening tool is the audit C. Uh, it's three questions. Uh, the audit C, the C stands for consumption because the first three questions of the audit measure or ask about alcohol consumption. That's why it's called the audit C. It's a brief tool that even has validity, not just for identifying risky drinking, but possibly uh, disordered uh, consequences too. Um, on one hand, the questions, if you look at here on the left of the audit C, um, are great when it comes to gender because they're a gender neutral. They don't ask about gender, so they're inclusive. We can use this tool with everyone. But uh, when a clinician needs to know or a, some clinical team member needs to know if someone's positive or not, the scoring guide typically used based on validation studies does the same thing. Uh, breaks people down only into men and women categories. 
Uh, there's something called the US audit C. So uh, the researchers who came up with the audit uh, decided a few years ago that they should also tailor the audit um, to a United States audience. We'll talk about this in a little bit. Um, if a clinic uses the US audit C, um, the questions are gendered, at least question number three is, as you can see, it says, how often do you have five drinks or more in one occasion as a man or four or more as a woman or age of over 65? So, again, that's a question that's going to exclude some patients. Uh, interestingly, though, when it comes to scoring, whether someone's positive or not, if you look down here, the cutoff scores, um, it combines men and women as a total of seven. And then it makes a distinction for younger males. Um, so there's a wide variety of how screening tools ask questions and how they score the answers. And sometimes they involve uh, gender and sometimes they don't. Then there's the audit. This is a full screen, it's 10 questions, most commonly used screening tool to identify alcohol use in primary care settings. Um, and a common way to score the audit, again, we use uh, traditionally, the cisgendered categories, even though the questions themselves, if you look on the right here, do not involve uh, gender. So, again, this is inclusive of everyone. We're not excluding anyone when we use the audit, but when we score it, when we try to determine who falls into what category, the recommendation commonly used, according to Johnson and colleagues, and, the, and including the version on our website, so the Espert Oregon website. Um, is a resource for the, uh, one of the resources for these tools, it's the website that I manage, and we uh, use these gender scoring guidelines. Um, so, and then there's the US audit. Um, again, an audit tailored specifically for a US audience. The problem here is today that question number three again uh, breaks it down into uh, two gender categories, and the scoring guidelines are also gendered. And lastly, I think the TAPS might be the next commonly used full screening tool. Um, and questions two and three then, uh, again, are separate people. This should only be answered by males. This should only be answered by females. So, uh, what's the problem with this? Well, the problem is, first of all, if we exclude trans and non-binary people, uh, that's too bad because there's a lot of them. Uh, a recent uh, well done survey that was published uh, last year, I think, or just a few months ago, actually, uh, identified 1.2 million people in the US who identify as non binary. So that's 1.2 million people who are excluded from those screening tools. Um, and a couple studies show that this population, uh, trans and non binary folks, have higher rates of alcohol use than cisgender people. Um, so that's not great if we're excluding them. And then one study showed a significant percent of trans people use substances to cope with mistreatment that may be correlated with their gender identity to live in this uh, culture and society as a gender minority person, um, unfortunately comes with uh, mistreatment. So here are some reasons why uh, it's really a drawback when we use screening tools that exclude non-binary and trans folks. More drawbacks. Um, when we give a screening, you know, a patient shows up in the waiting room, perhaps they're given the screening tool or maybe in the exam room, and they're a non-binary or trans person, and they are asked to choose between a male and female category or men and women. Um, besides excluding them, it also sends a message. It sends a message to everyone, actually, cis people too. Uh, the implicit message is that, you know, the cis categories of men and women are the default gender or the dominant gender. And I don't think that's a message, even implicitly, that clinics want to send, uh, but yet it does kind of reinforce that default uh, gender. And it's too bad because, you know, studies show that trans and non-binary folks do not always have great experiences in healthcare settings. Uh, when we don't fit into cisgender categories, that can be, that can elicit confused or maybe judgmental responses from maybe the receptionists or the rooming staff or the clinician. And some people respond to that by um, not going or delaying healthcare because it doesn't feel good uh, to be mistreated. And if they do get through the check-in process um, and, they, and they see their clinician about their medical complaint, 
uh, many cl clinicians did not have knowledge of trans care. Um, so there are barriers to getting health care for trans and non-binary folks that cisgender folks perhaps did not have to deal with. Um, and the result of this um, is when you get less care, that means they're going to get less screening for things like cancer. So there's some good reasons here why we should be aware of and try to minimize really not at all exclude uh, trans and non-binary folks from screening for alcohol use. So to summarize here, there's really three ways we exclude people. Uh, the questions themselves, when they only offer cis men and women categories, uh, the guidelines given to clinicians on how to score um, these tools, and then uh, we'll see here in this country, like many countries, we have what's considered authoritative low risk guidelines that determine uh, risky drinking. And when those guidelines, again, only recognize men and women, uh, that sends that message of a default gender to the, uh, to the whole population. You don't have to go to your doctor to feel discriminated against when you fill out these tools, just being a US citizen and receiving the public health message unfortunately exclude, excludes this population. So these are the three ways, uh, unfortunately, we exclude people. Um, uh, I have to have a slide here that defines terms. And again, I do this uh, knowing that it may be a rudimentary a way to properly define terms of gender. Um, and I do this knowing that there were probably attendees who feel that this doesn't accurately describe their gender or they use a different model to understand this. But I wanna give something at least because there's also people in the audience, including myself, uh, you know, up until a couple of weeks ago that could benefit from models that explain gender because they expand maybe what we, how we consider gender. So I'm gonna use this model um, and there's a circle here. So you can probably tell there's a Venn diagram coming um, and we're going to start with um, the label or category of trans men and women. The word trans implies that, you know, when we're all assigned sex and gender and when we're born, uh, for some people as we get older, whether it's at a young age or an old age or somewhere in between, that assigned gender and sex feels right. As we uh, become ourselves and we have our own identities, uh, that cisgender category uh, feels correct. And that's uh, and that correct term would be cis. For other people, um, as they get older, they find that that identity does not fit well. Um, and so they transition away from that sex or gender assigned identity. And some of these people um, identify into the other binary role. So maybe as someone who was assigned a female as gender or sex as a baby, as they got older, uh, they felt like they actually identify as a man or masculine. Um, so these folks, I think the term here is accurate, trans men, trans women, although some trans people identify simply as men or women, it's just not the one gender that was assigned to them. Other folks who transition away from their assigned sex or gender um, don't really go into the other dichotomous opposite pole of gender. Uh, that doesn't feel right to them either. So their assigned gender and sex does not feel right. Going into the other binary pole does not feel right. Um, so a term often used to describe this would be non-binary. And then some non-binary people feel comfortable under what's called the trans umbrella. They're okay with uh, identifying as trans and that feels inclusive enough to them to be non-binary. But other non-binary folks feel like, even though technically trans may be an accurate world because they, a word because they've transitioned away from their assigned sex or gender, um, you know, words come with baggage and maybe um, they don't really feel accepted in a trans community because maybe they've chosen not to alter their bodies, their hormones or surgery. And so to them, it doesn't feel like trans is really an accurate umbrella term. Um, so they identify as non-binary, but not necessarily trans. And there are other words for non-binary. Some people are like that word, or maybe in addition to that word, they use others, or maybe in re instead of that, not, that term non-binary, they use other words. And this is not a comprehensive list. 
Um, but terms like gender expansive may be a more accurate term to describe non-binary. Gender queer, queer being a word that has a history of being a, used as a slur, um, but that's been reclaimed by some people and, and that word gender queer may feel right to them. Agender, um, you know, no gender category perhaps feels right and, or is needed. Maybe the term agender feels most appropriate. Uh, maybe filling uh, identi identification with both genders or multiple genders, moving between the two in a fluid way. Uh, some indigenous North American um, nations have used the term or continue to use the term two spirit. And there's even more words here. So, this is not a comprehensive way to describe all gender, but I hope it provides a fundamental model to use. And we need to define our terms, of course, uh, when we talk about gender. So I hope that helps. Okay, what do we want? So we've looked at screening tools that exclude people, unfortunately. Um, ideally, I think every clinic wants this. They want to screen for alcohol use in a way that is informed by evidence. Um, but it maintains a gender affirming environment for everyone. We use validated screening questions and it's something that's feasible in a busy setting. Feasible is important. You know, I think what I um, specialize in, uh, which is not gender and which is not creating screening questions, but I do specialize in implementation and feasibility is a big one for a number of reasons. Um, it is a burden when we introduce substance use screening in a busy clinic setting. Um, so, why do these screening tools we just looked at use binary gendered categories to help identify unhealthy drinking? It's not because they necessarily wanted to, actually. It's because they were reflecting a standard um, or a, a guideline that's already established in this country before those screening tools were created. And uh, most or many countries have some sort of low risk guidelines. And this is what they are in the US and it's come from the US Department of Agriculture and the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism and IAAA. And how we define risky drinking compared to low risk drinking is again by quantity. And what is that quantity determined by the NIAAA? It is if you binge drink at least once in the last year, that is considered risky drinking. And they define that through a difference in cisgender category. So as you can see for men, they define it as five or more drinks for women, four or more drinks. So this exclusive nature of how we define risky drinking really starts with these standardized national guidelines and the screen tools are only really just reflecting uh, that. And then the other way to look at risky drinking is not just binge drinking, which is uh, occasion can mean usually two hours, sometimes it's defined a day, but then some people don't binge drink but they drink, you know, um, on most days, the not in the week, and that can also increase your risk for health problems too. And also that is gendered, as you can see, women technically get one drink per day, men get two. Um, and if you drink more than that, um, that increases your risk for long-term health problems, whereas binge drinking increases your risk for short-term ones like accidents and injuries and uh, drunk driving, car accidents, sexual assault, things like that. So this is where it all starts from. In this country, we genderize, gender, whatever, our drinking limits, and we stick to only two categories of gender. Uh, this is considered authoritative. And when we say drinks, um, in the US, we don't use a metric system. So we, we identified 0.6 ounces of pure alcohol as a drink. If that's converted to metric, that means 14 grams. So this, um, these authoritative low risk limits um, are how we recognize risky drinking, but some other organizations and some studies may point to a difference, um, even though those are authoritative, quote unquote. Uh, for example, some studies show a J-shaped curve, meaning some drinks may actually decrease your risk for morbidity and mortality. Um, although some people are critical of those studies, um, and then, then there's the National Cancer Institute. Uh, they suggest even one drink a day for anyone increases the risk of certain kinds of cancer. Um, so that is enough um, for them for that guideline. So 
we recognize these guidelines, but other people don't necessarily abide by those guidelines. And this is commonly cited. Um, you might be surprised that it varies by country. Um, and other countries that have low risk guidelines, um, not every, not all of them separate between men and women. So as you can see, Australia, the United Kingdom, Portugal, South Africa, um, look at lots of evidence. And uh, they say that they don't need to separate between men and women. Uh, but among the 33 countries that do, you can see that there's quite a range of what they believe is low risk limits, a range from 10 to 42 grams. Um, and again, a standard drink in this country is 14 grams um, or a weekly limit that ranges from 84 to 140. As you can see for men, it's the same thing. So what is the point of this slide? It shows that you know, geez, we should take our gendered low risk drinking limits with a big grain of salt. Uh, we might assume that they're based on biological factors, uh, but if that were the case, why such a wide variance between countries on what is considered low risk? And why do some countries not separate between men and women? So it's kind of questioning here, I guess, the authoritativeness of, of our low risk limits. Um, and to be fair, the epidemiologists who are tasked with identifying these, these limits themselves, at least these two, acknowledge how difficult this is and how complicated it is. So Deborah Dawson here, who used to work for NIAAA, uh, says right here, there are many conceptual and methodological challenges to arriving at a definition of risky drinking. And the person who helped develop the guidelines in Australia and Canada basically says the same thing. The challenges in developing this are immense. Um, so, it seems like everyone tries to back away from saying these low risk limits are perfect um, or apply universally. Um, everyone seems to be okay with saying take it with a grain of salt. And why is that? Why is it so complicated? Well, there's a lot of factors that go into identifying risky drinking levels or into how we metabolize alcohol and it can be something that's biological um, or something that's socially constructed and as a result uh, results from how we interact in our society uh, things like ethnicity and race and gender for example that do have a, are associated with how we are perceived and how we interact in society that can impact what it means to be uh, drinking at a risky level and then other things of course um, beyond just gender if you're larger than someone else, you might be able to process or be less affected by alcohol use. Um, if you're pregnant, obviously that has different implications. Um, drinking on a full or empty stomach actually can make a, a, a two or three a full uh, difference in how you're impacted by drinking. Not everyone is totally honest when they self-report. So should we adjust for that when we identify low risk uh, limits? If you're on medications, Maybe those low risk limits don't really apply or they need to be adjusted if, they are, if they're contraindicated. If someone's um, not uh, drinking at all because they're in recovery, should we really recommend that they, you know, that, that it's okay to drink up to um, 14 drinks a week or three in occasion? Probably not. And then the context is one thing to, uh, what if you drink, you binge drink, you're a cis man who has five drinks on one occasion, but you're sitting at home in your comfy chair watching TV, as opposed to someone who's about to operate machinery or someone who's about to go driving. Um, so the point here, there's a lot of things that impact risky drinking levels. It is complicated. And you could argue that, well, why are we using gender um, alone? If there's so many factors that impact this, why just use one of them? Um, more reasons to show how this is complicated when we try to determine low risk limits, the researchers who do this, um, acknowledge that it is subjective. You know, the more we drink, the greater our risk of harm. Well, where along that linear, uh, relationship, should we put a firm point on what is considered risky? Of course, uh, what's the threshold for the quality of studies we use to determine risky drinking? Um, we rely on self report. That's not the. The most reliable measure um, of measuring someone's uh, alcohol consumption. 
And then, you know, to be fair, if we're going to identify a low risk drinking limit, it probably should be something simple and easy to recall because the purpose of this is to give information to the public on health. And so if we acknowledge the complexity, I guess we're being more accurate, but we're probably not achieving our public health goal, which is to get information to the public because how realistic is it to think of a guideline that that takes into account 10 different factors? Um, we probably should keep it simple. So, yeah, and how we measure risk, whether it's relative or absolute, and then on the ground, when people drink alcohol, it's not delivered in standard drinks. It's, in this country, it's not, even though we identify 0.6 ounces as a standard drink, um, beer typically comes in all sorts of sizes of beverages. So it could be a 12 ounce can of beer, or it could be, um, a local pint from your brewery that varies of course a malt liquor has higher alcohol content so even when we do our best to identify drinking limits that we think are to be helpful in the real world how does that get translated and this is partly why it's complicated but as we make the point here that the national guidelines for low risk drinking should be taken with a grain of salt what we're focused on today, of course, is gender because people are being excluded when we use gender, binary, cisgender categories only to assess for this. So um, why do we do that? Well, here's, an, again, another opinion from a paper from Dr. Dawson who says that the sub substantial differences in men's and women's weekly drinking um, are not fully supported by the existing data. Uh, well, that's interesting. Unless some new evidence has come out since 2011, um, why are we using guidelines that are gendered when this person says they're not fully supported by existing data? So I think this just points to uh, the complexity and the controversy around uh, these using these limits. Um, she goes on to say here that a lot of the gap or the difference between what we recognize between men and women's lowest drinking really comes from inferring or extrapolating from a influential study that was done a while ago in Australia that found modest increases between premature death between men and women based on drinking limits. Um, and the court, the what we extrapolated was people assumed based on that study that well, there must be um, a biological mechanism behind the gender difference. Um, and it could be because maybe women are smaller on average than men. Maybe they have uh, less or more body fat. Maybe they have more or less water content in their tissues, a bigger or smaller liver. Maybe hormones play a, a role. These are actually all things that can affect alcohol metabolism. But the point here is the study didn't directly look at these biological factors and determining mortality, they made an assumption that because there was a difference in gender outcomes, that maybe it is because of these things. And that's an important distinction because there's a difference between expert opinion and using scientific evidence. And the connection here on scientific evidence was not uh, direct. And a good paper that points out these kind of criticisms um, like this um, is, is a paper called Where's the Science by A.J. Lowick and colleagues. And I, it's only two pages. I recommend reading it if you want to see what the main criticisms are. Uh, but some questions that are brought up on this when we use uh, cisgender categories for lower risk limits is, well, first of all, we're conflating gender and sex. Uh, we refer to these guidelines as gender. Even the researchers themselves use the word gender, but in fact, uh, we're probably using gender as a proxy for sex-based characteristics, and it's not good to conflate the two um, because a lot of people identify with a gender that is not correlated with their assigned sex uh, when they were born. But yet we, we continue to use the term gender when really we're trying to point out sex-based characteristics. And if there's so many different biological factors and other factors associated with lowest drinking, why are we using gender as basically a crude proxy for them? For example, if larger people are less impacted by alcohol use than smaller body mass, then why don't we screen for bigger body mass instead of using gender as a proxy for that? 
Same goes with hormones or liver size. Also, when we use sex-based factors, we, uh, these guidelines don't account for how these factors can change over time. Uh, when someone transitions, for example, they may use hormones or surgery. So how does that impact uh, what we assume to be sex-based biological factors? And of course, when we use these gendered categories, we're reinforcing stereotypes, perhaps of drinking behaviors. There's evidence that shows that when we send a message to a population that there's different limits or what's acceptable or risky um, based on gender, that we're kind of reinforcing perhaps um, uh, drinking behaviors that are judged in society based on gender. So if, if women get less uh, drinks before they hit that risky limit, and maybe that's saying, uh, reinforcing a stereotype uh, that to be a woman, you shouldn't be drinking as much as a man. And there's a whole paper about that. So uh, lots of criticism and it's good criticism. Um, I guess a response perhaps if you were to defend using the current guidelines or current screening tools um, that yes, you know, screening is by nature a crude or blunt tool. Uh, we don't have time in a clinic to go through all the factors associated with risky drinking. Um, screening by nature is a quick and easy way to identify someone who should get further assessment. There's a difference between assessment and screening. Screening is usually dichotomous, positive or negative, and assessment goes into the spectrum of what's going on. Um, and of course, like we said, lowers drinking guidelines to be effective probably should be pretty simple and easy to remember. Um, and and to be honest, and, and the authors of the previous paper here acknowledge that gender and sex can play a role in assessing risk, uh, but what they object to is to use it so crudely on a screening tool. Um, I mentioned before that other countries don't use gender, uh, so more evidence on how we um, can, why we criticize these low risk limits. Well, the United Kingdom, um, you know, pretty educated, advanced, First world country, I guess, uh, similar to the United States, uh, they think that the guidelines should apply to both men and women. You can see right there, they do not make a distinction. And they say that 14 units, what they call standard drinks on a week is the limit for all people. Uh, so that's interesting. And then I also pulled this quote here that um, they say the latest research indicates that drinking within the low risk guidelines, overall levels of risk are broadly similar for men and women. However, there's risks of immediate harms uh, that seem to be greater for men and long-term harms for women. So I think this kind of makes the case that when we screen, which is a quick, crude way to identify people, maybe we should take the gender out of it for the screening portion. And when the clinician is actually doing a, a more in-depth assessment, then it is more appropriate to consider uh, gender, although we can should consider Everyone's gender, of course, not just men, women. Um, this paper just came out a couple months ago, and it came from the United States Preventative Services Task Force. And if you don't know who they are, they are uh, the committee that decides um, whether it's worth your time as a busy primary care clinician to screen for something and intervene. They sift through all the evidence and they make recommendations, and their recommendations carry a lot of weight it's what health insurance uses for reimbursement a lot. It's what the government uses for performance metrics. And they came out with this paper and they basically said that uh, future reviews will identify the limitations of findings to diverse groups from underlying studies that use unclear terminology. So again, they're recognizing here that previously uh, they were using evidence that had unclear terminology around sex and gender and applying it to everyone. And that's not very accurate. They're also pledged to use gender neutral language when it's appropriate so they can include everyone of any gender. They're gonna uh, be clear when they state recommendations on how they apply to individuals with specific anatomy associated with biological sex as opposed to categories of gender identity. And they also recognize the limited evidence to inform the preventative care of populations based on gender identity. So the United States, the task force here is really making a big step forward um, and what is appropriate and what are good guidelines um, for research. Um, so if they're doing it, uh, maybe the NIAAA might be prodded here to take another look at their low risk guidelines currently 
and and maybe take the gender out of them or um, if there's enough evidence at another gender category. So what can we do moving forward? We're stuck with these screening tools um, and I have some concrete ideas about what we can do um, while we wait for better evidence, how we can use a full screen and brief screen to be inclusive, to include trans non-binary folks. Um, and the, the main piece of evidence I'm gonna use to, to make these suggestions is last year, we finally got um, a good validation study of gender minority people when it comes to alcohol use. Um, so almost 2000 uh, folks who identified as gender expansive or non-binary or trans, trans feminine, trans masculine. Um, and this study looked at what are appropriate cutoffs for this population specifically. And it came up with three recommendations. It came up with what they thought was best, which is just one question uh, with a cutoff of five or more drinks as defining binge drinking. And that has good validity to identify risky drinking with this population. Or if you use the out at C, they found that a cutoff score of three for positive works with this population. Or if you use the out at a cutoff score of eight. So this is great. We of course need more studies like this, uh, but I think this is enough to offer some suggestions in the interim. Um, so what can we do with screening tools currently right now to make them inclusive? Well, I give a thumbs down to the idea of asking patients to choose which cisgender feels right to them, which has been suggested by some people, like, well, someone's trans or non-binary, just ask them to pick one of those cis categories. Uh, and that's not good because it's not gonna give you accurate um, data. We don't have data that makes sense uh, and for that recommendation, and it just reinforces reinforces the idea of a default gender. It feels discriminatory. Um, it's no good. Another method that people have suggested: well, why don't we just ask people to, to use the gender or sex they were assigned at birth? Uh, but that just reinforces their uh, sex assignment. They they probably tried hard to transition away from. Um, it's probably an important part of their self identity, um, self actualization to to identify as not the gender or sex that was assigned to them. So we're just reinforcing something that they've worked hard to get away from. Um, and that doesn't feel good and it's not good science. So what can we do? Well, we can really do one of two things or both. We can add a gender minority category to both the questions and or scoring guides, or we can remove gender altogether from the questions and scoring guide. And I think both those things are ways to make um, our screening tools inclusive. So that's concrete ideas here. Let's go back to that single alcohol question with good validity for men and women alluded to earlier. Um, knowing what we know with that Fuente study on non-binary and trans folks, uh, what could we do? Well, what if we did this? We add a category using that Fuente story that identified five or more drinks as a cutoff for binge drinking. What if we added that to this, um, to this question. So there's still the cis categories of men and women, and that's based on the Smith study. Uh, but if we add a Flinte question, trans non-binary, uh, then we're kind of including everyone or most people. Um, we're not interfering with the Smith question because we're not changing it. Uh, we're not playing with the wording. Um, we're simply adding a question and it technically this would be two different screening questions, the Smith and the Fuente. We're just putting them together on a piece of paper to make it easy for patients um, to complete. Um, I think there's enough evidence from that one study to do this. However, I'm not an expert in screening tools and that kind of epidemiology. So I'm, I'm framing this as an idea. Um, another way we might be able to do this too is Again, removing the gender. What if we had one universal question as a single screening question? If for those clinics that use a single question, another option would be just to take the gender out. And what if we used four or more drinks in a day as a cutoff? So that way we include uh, cis women uh, and, we, and we include cis men and trans and non-binary. Now the drawback to this is we're probably gonna see an increase in false positives right, because we're lowering the, the number for everyone. But those points, those points between sensitivity and specificity in the literature aren't really that far apart. I don't think we'd see a huge increase in false positives. 
And I think it's justifiable. Anyone who says they've had four or more drinks on one occasion in the last year, it's okay to consider that positive because all that positive means is they get a full screen. They, they advance to getting the full audit or something else and maybe uh, a conversation. It's not like we react to a positive score on these brief tools with like a firm recommendation or a referral or you have to do something. Remember, usually all the intervention is, is a conversation based on, based on motivational interviewing. Uh, and that can build rapport uh, beyond even if a patient is not um, uh, drinking in a risky way, even if they are false positive. So the risk here, I don't think isn't great if we choose to use a universal cutoff. Uh, the other brief screen is the audit C, um, an idea for that. Again, the, the three questions here do not involve gender, so we're good to go there, but the tra traditional scoring guide is gendered. Uh, but using the Fuente study, who identified a uh, cutoff of three for trans and non-binary folks, well, why don't we just add that to the scoring guidelines? Um, so that way, when a trans person, for example, fills out the audit C, we know how, uh, using at least one study, uh, to consider them positive or negative or not. And that number is the same number as for cis women. Um, or we can, again, take the gender out perhaps and go with the lower number three or more for everyone. Again, we might have some more false positives, but probably not that much. Um, and it's a one scoring cutoff for everyone, makes it easy. Then there's the audit. And this gets a little complicated. I'm not sure what to do about the audit and here's why. And because um, the story about the audit is when the guide came out in 2001 on how to use the audit, it was a tool designed for everyone. The authors behind it, Baber and Hickenspittle, they designed this or helped people use it in a way that it's supposed to apply across countries. And remember, all these countries have different uh, ideas on what a standard drink is, different levels of grams of alcohol. So they came up with a scoring guide here based on four different zones, and notice that they didn't gender it. There's no difference here traditionally between men and women in their original scoring guide. Um, so everything's fine, except there's a problem. And that problem is question number three on the audit. If you go to this guide, this uh, what I cite here, the guidelines for use in primary care, they have an example of an audit screen tool. And question number three asks, how often do you have six or more drinks on one occasion? What most clinics did when they were like told, okay, you have to screen for alcohol use or you have to do expert, they probably Googled that the audit and they got that guide. And, okay, here's a copy of the tool. They photocopied it and they used it. Well, that problem is they didn't probably go through the fine print because if you go through the fine print of that audit guide, you're supposed to adjust question number three um, based on what in your country most closely gets you to a total of 60 grams of pure ethanol. Now, most clinics didn't do this, uh, and I don't blame them, because is it fair to expect a busy clinic to go through 30 pages of a guide on how to use a screening tool and then find this little paragraph that says, by the way, you should adjust the number of drinks for question number three. Um, but if, for, if someone did do that, they would come up with four drinks because in the US, 14 grams is one drink times four gets us close to 60. It's as close as we can get. So really what the original uh, audit was telling people to do in the US was to use four drinks um, for question number three. Most people didn't do that, including in our study at OHSU in Portland, we implemented Esprit in seven primary care clinics. And like most people, we just downloaded that tool, didn't notice that fine print, we used to cut out, we used six or more drinks, and we found in like two years that we had a really low rate of positive audit scores in our primary care clinics. Even though they are FQHCs, we are expected to see somewhere around 20% probably the positive rate. We were seeing 5% or less. What was going on? We weren't sure until um, we came out uh, with a Johnson study here that found that if you, it was a validity study that used four or more drinks um, and it divided folks up into these categories. So then we figured out, well, let's use this uh, study to, uh, as, as for our scoring guidelines. So 
technically in the US, we should be using four or more drinks for question number three. And traditionally using exclusive gender categories, this is what we used to use for the scoring guide. So if we were to apply the Flinte study to this, I'm not sure what to do, because on one hand, that audit guide says you can use your clinician judgment to determine maximum consumption allowances. You can use your judgment to determine the guidelines. It really is saying here that what cutoffs you decide to use in the audit really emphasizes clinician judgment. So maybe um, we could use this um, for everyone. Um, so I don't know what to do about the audit because I think in the Flente study, they used six drinks or more for question number three. Um, and if you do use an audit with that, use the cutoff of eight. That's what they recommended. If you use an audit with a, with a four drinks on one occasion, uh, maybe you can use a cutoff um, and take these gendered categories away and just use maybe four for everyone in risky and 13 for everyone in harmful. That's an idea I have. I'm not sure what to do, however, about the audit. I'm more confident about what to do on the audit C in a single question when it comes to including trans and non-binary people. So sorry to go to in the weeds there. I know it's complicated, but I had to point this out because it's really amazing how so many clinics are using the audit incorrectly, um, and it just points to how just little details can make all the difference in implementation. So let's summarize here what I'm suggesting here. If you use a single alcohol question in your clinic workflow, um, consider adding a trans and non-binary category um, or um, using one question for everyone. Both those strategies are based on evidence, um, and I think you're okay there. The audit C. Um, consider adding a trans or non-binary category to the scoring guidelines, really easy to do. And if you wanna use the audit and use that Flinte study, so it includes trans and non-binary people, use a cutoff of eight or um, consider maybe a lower cutoff depending on what question number three you use. So those are my ideas on how in the interim, we can use screening tools to be inclusive while we wait for better evidence. So, all right, I got here four minutes below time, but we can stay as long as we want for comments and questions. Uh, so my last slide here, what are the take home messages? Obviously we need more inclusive ways of research when we want to determine drinking limits and screening tool validity. Typically when we uh, recorded gender of study subjects, we just said, are you men or women? Um, so that's not an inclusive uh, way to do this. So we need to change that moving forward. And in addition to a more diverse way to collect this information, we also could benefit from more specific research on trans and non-barrier people when it comes to alcohol use. Uh, that would also be beneficial. But while we're waiting for all this, we can take immediate concrete steps to make our screening tools more inclusive. Uh, like I mentioned, we should examine them and determine how we can alter them to reflect both gender diversity and evidence. We don't wanna compromise scientific evidence. And I don't think we have to in order to be, in order to reflect gender diversity. Okay, that was a quick um, presentation about something that can get quickly complicated. I hope it was useful. Um, and now I think we're good to go with questions and comments. All right. Yeah, we've definitely had quite a few questions and comments come in. Um, so we'll just start at the beginning that we got oh, some. So uh, in a college setting, the binge drinking rate can, can drastically change the effectiveness, effectiveness of the audit C, how can we adjust the audit to account for the more common binge drinking occurrences in college? Great point. You know, um, if we wanna be specific to a population like college students and young adults, by the way, have the highest rates of binge drinking um, and, and weekly drinking, um, maybe we could adjust the audit C with the scoring guide in the audit. Um, I don't know this, you know, this presentation was about gender, not age, um, but you raise a good point. Uh, maybe there's enough studies out there to where we could use the audit or audit C in a more accurate way to do that. 
Um, but that's another topic that would require looking at those studies that differentiate on age rather than gender. Um, and also, um, so I just want to confirm with you, Jim, um, will we be able to have these slides to post? A lot of folks are asking about. Um, oh, yeah. Seeing the slides and checking them. Okay, great. Yeah, I'll send these to Marla and she'll send it out to everyone. Great. Okay, next question. I've always liked the cage questions. Would would this not be helpful here? Cage questions are great. It's a validated tool. The problem is cage only asks about consequences. It's pretty good at identifying possible disorder, um, but it doesn't ask about quantity uh, or number of drinks. And so it's missing risky drinkers. So it's a good tool to use in addition to something like the audit C, but the cage itself, I didn't really go over here because when questions ask about consequences associated with use, they're usually not gendered. Um, so it's not really a problem here. Great. Then someone said, this is fantastic information. How do we get EHRs to be adaptable as you suggest? It's a big barrier to implementation and can result in poor care when stuck with what the EHR includes. You are absolutely right. You know, a, a robust EHR that supports what we're trying to do on a, in a workflow in a clinic is really important. Um, it reinforces the workflow and it's important for metric reporting reasons when we need to report what we're doing. But a lot of EHRs are very insufficient. So what can you do? Depends what EHR you use and it depends on what kind of robust IT support you have in changing your EHR or adapting it. And that varies widely. You could be an FQHC that subscribes to um, Ocean Epic, which is uh, Epic that FQHCs share. Um, you have a little bit of power there to offer suggestions, but there's a lot of clinics uh, subscribe to that. So it kind of has to be something that applies to everyone. Um, maybe you have a smaller EHR where you can make changes. Um, so, um, and also I just learned that the US audit, the highly gendered version of the audit has been formally embedded into EPIC. Um, that has pros and cons, uh, like we talked about. So how do we change our EHR? That's really specific to how it works in your clinic setting. Maybe you're part of a network of clinics. Maybe you're just one clinic subscribed uh, to a monthly fee of an EHR. Um, I know at OHSU when we wanted to improve our EHR, Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, you know, was a teaching hospital. There were like five or six different departments that had to come together uh, for weekly meetings to agree upon what screen questions we use, how that's recorded in the EHR, uh, how to build dot phrases in the progress notes to appropriately document it. That's a lot of meetings. It was a lot of time to build those tools. And then once we have the tools, we had to train people how to use them. So that was a quite laborious process because we had to get pediatrics on board with emergency medicine, with family medicine. So that's probably on the more complicated scale. On the other hand, we did have a robust IT team who was ready to do that work. So again, all I can say, it's very specific to your own situation. All right. And then this one, I guess, is more of a comment, but you might be able to um, elaborate a little bit more on it. Um, so one person said those uh, relating to gender, those would be awkward questions to ask. People could become more comfortable after t after time. Um, so I guess just speaking to how talking about gender can be a little uncomfortable. Interestingly, interesting. I don't know if that's a good argument for keeping a gender minority category off of a screening question. Uh, I think if we're going to separate people between men and women, it's okay to also have a category for non-binary and transgender. Whether or not that makes anyone comfortable, I don't think is a priority. Um, yeah, so that's my answer. Great. Okay, then. Um, have you looked at the newer U.S. audit, which makes some adjust adjustments for Q3, but does not address the trans issue? Um, I have not seen a newer U.S. audit. Well, maybe you're talking about the normal audit's written up here, the U.S. audit C, um, or the U.S. audit. 
Um, yeah, you're right. The, the US audit is an adapted version of the main audit that specifies question number three just for a US audience because it uses our US low risk drinking guidelines in that question. But the problem is, of course, it uses men and women categories, just like our low risk limits guidelines dictate. Um, and the scoring guide also just uses women and men categories. So as far as I know, this is the only version of the US audit out there, and it is problematic. I don't have a suggestion on how to use this in a gender inclusive way, because it would mean changing this question terminology as well as the scoring guidelines. So. The US audit is a good tool for cisgender people, I think, because it, it gives a little more exact measurement of what a low risk limit is, because it has additional questions that define a quantity and frequency of drinking. But again, it's 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 probably the most gender exclusive tool, unfortunately, out there. Um we have a few more. Why was your recommended threshold for non-binary trans patients five or more drinks per day for the single alcohol question? The same for cis men, but the threshold right. for the audit was the same for cis women. So the threshold for the audit was the same versus, oh yeah, right, because, so this study um, for the single question had strong evidence for just this one question with a cutoff of five was good validity for this population. That's what they recommend using. I tried to extrapolate that to the audit, but the problem is, like I tried to go into before, is that the study probably used a version of the audit that asks six or more drinks on one occasion um, for question number three. Other audits use uh, four or more drinks in one equation, question number three. Um, so um if you use the old audit this study suggests of using a cutoff of eight if you want to include this population in your scoring guidelines if you use an audit that uses a different question number three like we do on our website i'm just going to have to rely on the authors or the researchers recommendation to emphasize a clinician judgment and lower or raise a thresholds for risky drinking um, based on your own judgment based on how many false positive or false negatives you want to put up with. Um, so um, that's why there's that difference. It is complicated. The authors of the study, I think, would not say we should emphasize the audit so much. They really like this single question. Um, so there you go. Great. All right, well, that is about all the questions we had. Um, we uh are still getting lots of positive comments and just lots of thank yous uh for the great presentation and just a reminder for everyone you can look at jim's work or get in touch with him at espertoregon.org and i am just going to take us out here with a few housekeeping things we would like to remind all participants that a recording of today's presentation will be uploaded to the webinar library located on iretta's website sometime next week. Once we have these resources posted, a link will be sent to all of today's webinar registrants. I now want to remind you of our evaluation and CEU process. You will receive several follow-up emails from us. The first email will include a link to the evaluation and second email will include step-by-step -step instructions on how to obtain CEUs. Please note that it will take up to 48 hours for your CEUs to become available because we have to cross-check your attendance records with our WebEx technology. We would like to especially request that you fill out our evaluation. It should take no longer than two minutes of your time. Again, we want to thank everyone for taking time out of your day to participate. And if you have any questions at all, please email us at info at iretta.org. And we also want to just thank Jim again for such a great presentation. Um, we always love having you present for us and uh looking forward to the next one <laughs> thanks everyone yeah thanks so much have a great rest of your day and happy holidays <laughs>